Amen. Amen. I don't know uh, if you ever look at my sermon titles or not. Uh, in the bulletin, I try to help you know uh, a little bit about where we're going and the thoughts that I'm thinking. And of course, that's dangerous that you would think the thoughts or go there. But uh, warfare, suit up. Uh, I don't know if you've ever heard that phrase before, suit up. Uh, some of y'all, like, well, okay, I'll just confess me. I loved comic books growing up. I mean, that was, my, that was my retreat. I was all into comic books. And then they started making them into movies. And uh, there was this whole set of movies about a group called the Avengers. And, and, and there was Captain America. Come on, right? Captain America. Okay. Uh, I, I'm getting, yeah, I'm getting. I, I, Leanne's testifying. I said Captain America. And his name's what? Chris what? What's his name? Chris Evans. She's blushing now. Don't, even, don't look back there, y'all. Don't look back there. But uh, there was a couple of phrases that were real big uh, in, in some of those movies. Um, one of them was Avengers Assemble. And that meant it was time for everybody to get together. Let's go. It's, it's time to get together. But there was another phrase in there that said, suit up. And when Captain America told everybody to suit up, that means we're about to get in a fight. We are about to get in a fight. It's time to be prepared for battle. Suit up. Well, uh, th this phrase was also very big. You have to be careful what you Google, right? So I Googled suit up. And, and uh, anybody ever heard of a show called How I Met Your Mother? Has anybody heard of that? Have I got two, three, four, four, five? Can I get six? Can I, okay, seven. All right. Want to be an auctioneer. But... Uh, Barney Stinson was the character. Barney was out of the whole group. He was the sharp businessman, made tons of money, and he was about to suit. I mean, it was about wearing the suit. It was about being suited up. And when he said get suited up, he meant get the best suit possible and put it on because it's time to go to work. It's time to go to work. Well, I got to thinking about uh, how we dress. And, you know, there's certain uniforms people wear. And you know exactly who they are when you see them. Uh, if you see a police officer or sheriff and they carrying that gun and they got on that uniform, you know who they are. And you slow down. I've seen you. I've seen you hit your brakes. You ever go into a courthouse and see somebody in a big old black robe? Yeah, that's the judge. And I remember I was in a bad car wreck and it was all my fault in 2005. And they told me that, the, like, district attorney or whoever, said, now, if all the insurance has covered everything, just get up and say, guilty, no lawyer. What? So I had to stand up in front of the judge, and they kept rolling us in, and guilty, no lawyer. Okay, move along, move along. I said, oh, that was pretty easy. I just told a judge I'm guilty, and I'm thinking, am I going to prison? Am I going to jail? Um, different people have uniforms. Uh, mechanics often very distinct. You know, blues usually blue and, and a name tag. I love name tags. Why don't everybody wear name tags? You know, a UPS driver, do you know who they are? Yeah, they got on the brown uh, United Postal Service, right? Jan, do you have to wear a uniform? No, okay, she hides. She hides at work. But you know who people are by their uniforms. And then I got to thinking about military personnel. And I don't know, have you ever seen the Navy dress blues? Navy dress blues, now they're sharp. They are just, yeah, yeah. Uh, that, was a long, that was a long career he had, wasn't it, George had, uh, in the Navy. Dress blues are incredible. Marine Corps dress whites, dress blues. I saw, uh, okay, I, was, I did a funeral and I thought he was uh, Marine Corps, but he had dress whites on. Who is that? Oh, that's Navy? But he had a real sharp collar on. Uh, always, yeah, military uniforms are tough, right? They're just, and you know who they are. And then when they're in fatigues, you ever been in like a McDonald's or somewhere and a group of them come in? They all laced up. They're ready. Where are you, Devin? Yeah, yeah. You ready to go, right? I mean, you got on the fatigues this time to work. Then I got to think, you ever seen a priest? Have you ever really seen a real priest? Yeah, I mean, so robes, you know, robes. It depends on where you grew up in church, uh, robes. And then if you're ever at the hospital, you get to see that little white collar. 
little white cow. Well, you know who they are, right? And I got to thinking about what does that mean for us? Um, in Romans 13, I think, oh, I forgot the verse. Romans 13, 14, I think. It says we are to clothe ourselves in Christ. We are supposed to dress up into Jesus. One of my friends uh, years ago uh, came up with this uh, slogan phrase for the church, we're Jesus with uh, skin on because we're filled with the Spirit of God and we're to go out as Jesus sends us out. We're to be Jesus in the world. But I got to thinking about, you know, we need to, we need to look like Him, right? We need to connect in such a way that people would actually know that we belong to Jesus. Uh, when I was a young pastor, like a week ago, <clears throat> I used to go to a lot of uh, basketball games, baseball games, because we had little kids, and everybody had little kids. So, hey, you know, my daughter's playing, my son's playing. And so this one family, big family in our church in Belmont, they would all go to the basketball games. And I mean, it'd be a crowd, kind of like us sharing at the wrestling matches. And there was this huge crowd, and I'd go with them all the time, and you know, the whole family knew me, and I'd go up and sit with the family. And So one day I'm up there, and the husband, his best friend, he come to see his, uh, this guy's daughter play, and we're all talking, having a really good time. And finally, the dad's friend looks over and says, Who is he? And this fellow said, Oh, that's my pastor. When he said that, his friend went, What? You go to church? That'd be a little awkward, wouldn't it? That'd be a little awkward. Oh, I, I got a lot of fun out of that. That poor fellow, every time he came to church, I'd say, Do you go to church here? Does anybody know? Well... Our lives should reflect the Lord. People ought to know that we're His. Uh, I want to read you a, a short scripture, and we're going to walk through it. You know it. You learned it in Sunday school. It was one of those. Anybody remember flannel graph? Anybody? If I got one or two, and you stuck little cutouts onto the flannel, and they stayed, and and so you'd put the helmet up, and the and the armor, and the sword, and so listen to the text. A final word, be strong in the Lord and in His mighty power. Put on all of God's armor so that you will be able to stand firm against all strategies of the devil. For we are not fighting against flesh and blood enemies, but against evil rulers and authorities of the unseen world against mighty powers in this dark world, against evil spirits in the heavenly places. Therefore, put on every piece of God's armor so you will be able to resist the enemy in the time of evil. Then after the battle, you will still be standing firm. Perfect song, Matt. Uh, yeah, my good songs today, perfect. <laughs> Stand your ground, putting on the belt of truth and the body armor of God's righteousness. For shoes, put on the peace that comes from the good news so that you will be fully prepared. In addition to all of these, hold up the shield of faith to stop the fiery arrows of the devil. Put on salvation as your helmet and take the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. Now, I didn't include verse 18, but there's one more powerful weapon. It says, pray in the Spirit at all times. Listen, we, uh, we're in a fight. <laughs> and often when you look around, it looks like we're losing the fight. Uh, the enemy is hard at work, and often we don't give him enough credit that Satan's out there working against us, and sometimes we give him too much credit that he controls us, and we have no say in it. The truth is, we belong to a mighty God, and greater is he that is in me than he that is within this world. And sometimes we forget that when the devil comes. Uh, was, it, was it Flip Wilson that said, the devil made me do it. The devil made me do it. I just liked it when he did. Here come to judge. Here come to judge. Well, we have an enemy. And that's the first thought here. We have an enemy. 
Do you understand you have an enemy? You know, in life, you'll maybe tick somebody off and they won't like you too much. Maybe when you're in grade school or high school, somewhere along the way, there was somebody you were butting heads with and, and you just didn't get along and, and you kind of knew, you, you'd kind of look around. Uh, I'd always be around high school going, is Daryl over there? Okay, I'm okay. But, uh, <laughs> but you know, sometimes in life you can, you can get an enemy. Sometimes as adults we get some enemies. Uh, sometimes things can go south and sour in relationships, in business uh, uh, partnerships. A lot of things, we have enemies. But, but the real enemy that we have is, is Satan. Uh, the text calls him over and over again the devil. And uh, I, don't, I don't know, you know, some people I, I think uh, don't want to believe he exists or, or thinks it's too supernatural. But our scripture says he has a plan. He has a plan, and so it says it this way in verse 11, put on all of God's armor so that you will be able to stand firm against all strategies of the devil. All strategies. Listen, he's got more than one plan. He's got more than one way to get at you. If you've ever read C.S. Lewis's little tiny book, The Screw Tape Letters, uh, it's a phenomenal story about how a demon comes after a Christian. And uh, it's just phenomenal. And the book goes on and on in different ways. This demon is going to try uh, to get this Christian to renounce his faith. But it's a lot of strategies. And you know, he doesn't have a big old pitchfork and shows up with flaming red horns because you'd know who he was then. He's a little voice that whispers in your ear. Yeah, I'm old, you know, those little cartoons. And you'd have an angel on this shoulder and a devil on this shoulder. Y'all remember? Y'all remember? Okay, thank you. I got nervous there. I know I'm not as old as one or two of you. Uh, his reputation precedes him. Um, the term devil is used. Um, the Hebrew term uh, for, uh, for the devil is Satan. And the Greek term uh, for the devil is diabolos. And so Satan means to attack or accuse. His literal name is, he attacks you and he accuses you. I mean, that's pretty clear, right? Uh, not, not, no ambiguity there. And then the term uh, diabolos means to be a false accuser, to sl a slanderer, uh, to lead along as a spectacle, to bring into disgrace. Pretty clear, pretty clear. And so when the Bible references the devil, we need to be very clear who it's talking about. It's the one who came to kill, steal, and destroy. Do you understand that? And you know, this is a tough one. I know when the devil's using me because I'm tearing something down. And when we're tearing someone else down, the enemy is using us. But when we're building someone up, God is using us because in John 10.10, 10, Jesus says, I came that you may have life and life to the full or the abundant life. God gives life, Satan takes life. God builds up, Satan tears down. Well, his reputation precedes him and he is up to no good. He, he has a job and he knows his time is short and the Bible said so. And falling and failing is not an option. Falling and failing. I couldn't decide which word I like better. Uh, so I just put them both in there. So if you're doing, anybody doing the sermon notes? Okay, some of y'all are. Uh, you know it is not an option. And this is how it says it. Be strong in the Lord and in His mighty power. Put on all of God's armor so that you will be able to stand firm against all the strategies of the devil. We are not to fall, we are to stand. Amen. Amen. Uh, Tom Rainer, uh, he is kind of the, the, the church guru out there that uh, does a lot of support work for churches. And when I was a new pastor, he used to teach Sunday school uh, materials and how to build your Sunday school. Uh, just, you know, just a huge name. Really uh, was able to help a lot of churches move forward. Eventually, he started uh, an organization called Church Answers, and he supports churches, has phenomenal resources. But he, he got to picking on himself recently. This is a recent article. 
He says, I am a church member. I teach a small group in my church. I occasionally preach. When my pastor's out, I give to the church faithfully. I've been involved in other ministries in the church over the years. But I sometimes start acting like a church consumer instead of a committed church member. Instead of focusing on others, as 1 Corinthians chapters 12 and 13 clearly demonstrate, I start acting like the church is supposed to serve me. I want to get my needs met. I want things a certain way for my family and me. And then he says it this way, My unholy trinity is me, myself, and I. Recently, he says, I started tracking my own attitude by going through a series of signs that may, uh, that my commitment to my church is not what it should be. And he says, I came up with 11 that I saw in myself that said I was no longer a church member, committed church member. I'd become a church consumer. The first thing he says is my worship attendance became optional, or that is a sign. Your worship attendance becomes optional. Number two, you replace in-person attendance <clears throat> with only watching church on TV. Your attendance to a small group is declining or you just stop going altogether. Your attitude towards your church is critical, more critical. Your giving declines or stops. You critique sermons instead of listening prayerfully. Let me just stop there and say, you know if the sermon's really bad, just stop and start praying. God help him. Just God help him. And maybe he will. Okay. Just wanted to throw that in there. And a preacher wrote that down. You critique sermons instead of listening prayerfully. You see church as a place to meet your needs instead of your meeting the needs of others. You move readily to another church when your needs are not met. You get frustrated at what other church members aren't doing. They should be doing that. Can I get an amen? <laughs> okay. You don't pray for your church regularly. And then he said, this is the pinnacle of all of them. He says, you don't share the gospel anymore. That's tough. Falling and failing is not an option. We are to stand we're to suit up, and suiting up begins by knowing we need to because we have an enemy coming after us. Listen, you don't want to get into the fight if you don't have your armor on. Well, we are in a war, and I know that seems very, very simple to say, but often we don't realize it. We think, oh, my life's good, things are going well, I don't have a lot to think about. But Paul says we don't fight against flesh and blood, but against powers and principalities in the heavenly realms. We are in a fight. And so war has to be defined. And so we need to understand the first thing we have to understand is I'm not your enemy and you're not my enemy. And that goes for all of humanity. <clears throat> we make a lot of people out to be our enemies, don't we? Our enemy is the one who's working in the heavenly realms trying to work against us, these powers and principalities, and it makes sure that we know they're evil. And they're working against us. But too often, we put the stressors on each other. I know uh, Kim and I, when I started pastoring, had gotten to having some very long and loud discussions. You, you, you get it? And they had gone on, I, I mean, I'm thinking it was about two weeks, and I was about to lose my mind, and uh, I don't know if she'd gone by the gun store yet or not, but we were in a discussion, and it just hit me like a brick in the head. And I just looked at her, and I said, Satan's winning. And literally the moment I said that, it was like everything changed. And then I couldn't even remember what we were fighting about. You ever been in one of those fights and you have no idea why you were even bickering back and forth, but the enemy is working against us and we need to understand he's at work. Well, war must be defined and it is not with each other. It is with the enemy of our souls. The presence of evil saturates. The presence of evil saturates. Listen to this. 
Uh, it says here, let me get my finger here, for we are not fighting against flesh and blood enemies, but against evil rulers and authorities of the unseen world, against mighty powers in this dark world, unseen world, dark world, and against evil spirits in the heavenly places. Evil is everywhere. And maybe you would say, I don't agree with that, Joe. I don't think evil's everywhere. Well, you can probably go to about any town and you find a mass shooting. You can go to any town and you can find about all kind of evil things that happen. And maybe you say, well, no, that's mental illness or that's this. Listen, if someone goes to an elementary school and shoots a bunch of kids, that is evil. No matter how you want to define it, that is evil. If somebody walks into a prayer meeting at a church and kills people in prayer meeting, and that happened, you remember that? That's evil. That's what that is. It's evil. Um, on and on, we keep seeing these things happen. And are we aware? That is evil, and evil is prevalent, and it is saturating our world. And that's the violence that's out there big time. Turn on the TV. Any of y'all ever uh, heard Paul Harvey uh, do the story, If I Were the Devil? It actually came out in 1965. I think Terry was out of high school then, right? It's going to be a long walk through the parking lot. Um, but he says, if I were the devil, and he starts to talk about all the things he would do. This is 1965. And he says, you know, I'd get religion out of school. Um, I, would, I would quit disciplining children. Uh, I would make the government, my God, I thought that was interesting. I mean, just on and on, all these things he says. And at the very end of it, he says, well, if I were the devil, I'd just keep on doing what he's doing. That was 1965. Listen, evil's at work. Evil's at work, and the Bible says he knows his time is short. And so he's hard at work. The Bible makes it clear. And this is the good news. Resistance is not futile. Now, some of y'all are Trekkies. Do I have one Trekkie here? Do I have... And when they went up against the Borg, the Borg would say, resistance is futile. Or I like to say, futile. I don't know how you talk. I'm from Candler, but that's the correct way of saying it. Futile. Resistance is futile. You can't get out of this. You will be assembled. And listen, when it comes to evil, you don't have to be assembled. You don't have to give in to that. You don't have to play the game. You don't have to go along with it. Therefore... Put on every piece of God's armor so you will be able to resist the enemy. You can resist him. You can resist him. And look at this. Resist the enemy in the time of evil. Then after the battle, you will still be standing firm. We're in a war, we're in a battle, and we're supposed to keep on standing. Now Elton John would have said it this way. I'm still standing yeah, yeah, okay, uh, yeah, I, I tried, it was, it was almost there, but uh, suiting up prepares us for the onslaught of the battle that is raging all around us. We are a people at war. Do you understand that? You, 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 can't, uh, you can't check out now. It, it, it's, it isn't time to go AWOL. Right? Did you sign up in the first place? Did you sign up to serve the Lord? Well, that's called salvation. Did you go to boot camp? Did you get discipled? Did you have someone help you to learn to read the Bible, to learn what it says, to, to hear God's voice? That's called boot camp. And then we get to go fight. And that's how it works. You can't go to fight till you sign up, right, Devin? You got to sign that paper on the dotted line, right, Wayne? A lot of y'all understand that. You signed up on the dotted line. That didn't mean you'd done anything yet, but they had your ink. And then they would have the rest of you. <laughs> right, Doug? <laughs> they would have the rest of you. Oh, boy. Well, we got to get suited up because we're a people at war. Well, what's the good news? What is the good news? And we stand with the king. Hallelujah. We stand with the King, the King of kings and the Lord of lords. And at the name of Jesus, every knee 
shall bow and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. And He's Lord of all. He's Lord of all. And you know, right now, people can argue, ah, oh, there's this and there's that. Listen, I've read the end of the book. I know that's a cliche, but it's still true. It's still true. It's still true. He wins, and we can participate with Him. Well, He designed the armor. And it says, therefore, put on every piece of whose armor? God's armor, not your armor. And I, I, I want to share this in a second. But you put on every piece. He designed the armor so you will be able to resist the enemy in the time of evil. Stand your ground, putting on the belt of truth and the body armor of God's righteousness. Now, the, the Holy Spirit has a job. And His job is to lead us into all truth. Look it up. <laughs> Jesus said, I am the way, I am the truth, and I am the life. Listen, we're to clothe ourselves in Christ, and that's how we know the truth. And listen, when you stay in the truth, and that's what the Holy Spirit leads you to, the Bible, and when you stay in the truth, you'll know when somebody's trying to deceive you. You know what I'm saying? When somebody's trying to lead you astray, if you know what's in here, they're not going to get you. But if you have no idea what's between these pages, study the Gospel of John. Gospel of John, that's a good place to start. Read it to death. Read it to death. Well, he has designed the armor, but this is what really got me. It says, and the body armor of God's righteousness... God's righteousness. David said in the 23rd Psalm, He leads me in the path of righteousness for His name's sake. It's not for me. And when you're trying to resist the devil in your own strength, you will fail and you will fall. I don't have the strength and you don't have the strength. Listen, Billy Graham didn't have the strength to stand against Satan on his own. But you know what Billy Graham did? He let the Holy Spirit move him and give him strength. And listen, that has been the story uh, from the beginning of time. You get to the end of chapter 11 of the great heroes of the faith. They allowed God to help them stand. Why was it that Abraham uh, was considered righteous? He believed God. It wasn't that he was righteous. He did a bunch of crazy stuff. He constantly lied about his wife, right? Not good. But he trusted God. Well, he has equipped us for war. And if you look at this armor, we have a lot of defensive type armor on. And so you got the helmet of salvation. Listen, when you get saved, you're covered from the top down. When you give your life to Christ, you are covered from the top down. Until, until before you're saved, your head is uncovered and the devil's going to take your head off. My mother-in-law was from the Philippines, and I don't know why she ever shared this with me. She loved me. I loved her bunches too. She was awesome. But she said, you might have to get a Filipino haircut. I would think, what, is, what does that mean? What is that? What, what, what is, I'm not real smart. And then my father-in-law told me he had a little piece of land he had already prepared for me. It's about four feet by about six feet. It was next to a tree, so it's very lovely. Not sure what all that was. We have all of this defensive armor we're to put on, and then you think, okay, all God wants us to do is sit in a corner and pray, and God will protect me, and God will protect me, and we can quote Psalm 46, God is our rock and our refuge, and ever-present help in times of, of struggle. We can quote a lot of those scriptures that says, He who abides under the shadow of the Almighty. We can think about those places where we can hide, where He hid Moses in the cleft of the rock, and we can sing about that. But listen, that ain't the whole story. We're to take up the sword of God, which is the Word of God. We're to be on the offense too. Listen, we're in a defensive pose because we're getting ready to strike. But we ain't attacking each other. We're coming after the enemy by serving God, by carrying out His will. And it says it this way, and take the sword of the Spirit, 
Where do you get that sorted? Well, we know it's the Word of God, but who gives us the Word of God within us? It's the Holy Spirit of God. And He'll remind you, it, Jesus said, don't even worry about what you're going to say when you get caught and when, when people want to come against you. He says, I'll give it to you at that moment in time. The Holy Spirit within us. And the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. Again, we got to have the Word in us. And then I didn't read this verse, but I mentioned it. Pray in the Spirit at all times. That's all offense. That's offense. We got on the armor that's defense, but He made us to be prepared for offense. And finally, He has prepared us for victory. He has prepared us for victory. Again, verse 13, Therefore put on every piece of God's armor so you will be able to resist the enemy in the time of evil. Then after the battle, you will still be standing firm. Listen, after the dust settles, you're still standing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You'll still be standing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And you can say, I'm still standing. Amen. 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 If you're able to stand, stand with me. Let's bow before the Lord. Father, we know it was your plan all along that we suit up. <laughs> and Lord, we know that you were going to protect us because you are God. You prepare a table before us in the presence of our enemies because you're God. And Lord, we know you energized us to, to be able to stand against the enemy, to not fall, to not fail. Lord, we just want to thank you for that. We, we sing with, <laughs> with a lot of gusto, Lord, victory in Jesus, my Savior forever. He sought me and he bought me with his redeeming blood. He loved me ere I knew him and all my love is due. He plunged me to victory beneath the cleansing flood. Jesus, we testify to that. And there is victory in you. Lord, your word says, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. You, Jesus, told Peter that all things were possible with God. With man, they were impossible, but with, with you, they were all possible. Lord, the psalmist told us that he had no good thing apart from you. And we, we testify to that. Lord, apart from you, we don't have anything. And so, Lord, help us to understand we have everything in you. And you are our help. You are our strength. Lord, make it so clear. Make it so clear. And Lord, if, if somebody has forgotten to sign up to be in your service, Lord, make it clear they need to, they need to come to you and sign up to be yours. And Lord, maybe some have... Uh, Decided to take leave <laughs> uh, unofficially. God, bring us back to service so that we can serve and be found faithful. God, you help us. You know where we are in the fight. And Lord, if I've got a brother or sister here today that just feels completely beaten down, would you remind them that they have you? That greater is you that is within them than that old enemy that's floating around in this world. Lord, make that clear. Encourage them. Lift them up because you can. And Lord, maybe some are just in the most intense fight of their lives. Help them to see who the enemy is. And then, Lord, fill them up. Fill them up. Because you do. We confess with Jeremiah... You are faithful. You are faithful. And you are good. Lord, help us where we are. And we'll thank you for it all. Because we ask it all in the name of Jesus. And let all God's kids say together, Amen and Amen and Amen. I'm going to share the benediction, but if you'd like to come to the altar, if you would like to pray with our brother here, that'd be a beautiful Beautiful thing. Um, if you'd like to come and pray. We don't pray alone here. But I'm going to share this benediction. And, and if you feel led, uh, you, can, you can go. This is how Peter said it. And I think Peter knew what he was talking about. 
Stay alert. Watch out for your great enemy, the devil. He prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. Stand firm against him and be strong in your faith. Remember that your family of believers all over the world is going through the same kind of suffering you are. In His kindness, God called you to share in His eternal glory by means of Christ Jesus. So after you have suffered a little while, He will restore, support, and strengthen you. And He will place you on a firm foundation. All power to Him forever. Amen. Go with God, He goes with you.